Hi everyone, welcome back to Biology 1124 lab. Today we are going to be taking a look at how various chemicals affect the nervous system of some Daphnia. If you haven't already, you need to have downloaded and read through the lab background and also completed those pre-lab questions. So if you haven't, go ahead and pause this video and do that and then continue on. So today what we will would have been doing in class was making a research proposal, then carrying out your experimental design, collecting your data, and making your graphs. You then would complete the lab summary, data, graphs, and upload all of that to Canvas. The question we investigated would be, why are some heart rates different than others? I feel like that is kind of a vague question, but the short answer to it is because of neurons, which are nerve cells, as well as muscle cells. A bit of a longer explanation is because adding chemicals to Daphnia can have different effects on the neurons, which therefore will affect how their heart muscles work. So, first things first, neurobiology is really confusing, and it's okay if you don't fully understand it yet. Just try to get the main gist of the next few slides, and feel free to email me with any questions you have if you are struggling with this. Um, check out Khan Academy, uh, Academy, Google, whatever you have resources available to you to try to understand this a bit better. So, first off, how is the heart rate regulated? On the left here, you see a neuron. So, here in the red box is the part of the cell called the cell body, which is probably what you think of when you hear the word cell. It's got the nucleus, various organelles. This is kind of the main core of a neuron. All around it, are these things called dendrites, which receive signals from other neurons that tells the neuron what to do. Here you see the myelin sheath down the length of the neuron. It's this case here that kind of wraps around the main part of the neuron. And basically you can think of this kind of as like insulation. So a lot of you I know are interested in the medical field and diseases like MS or other neurological diseases have to do with the smiling sheath getting degraded and it can cause paralysis and all kinds of nasty things. Then finally down here at the bottom we have axon terminals which are what sends the signals to the next neuron or to the muscle cells, depending on what this neuron is connected to. You can see here that it is not touching one another. Um, they have this little gap in between called a synapse, and this is where neurotransmitters go to go from one neuron to the next. So up here, we've got this um, main part of the axon, like we have circle in orange over here. These signals get traveled down the length and neurotransmitters and vesicles get released into the synapse and then receptors on the dendrites of another neuron accept all of this. So to put this into perspective for you, let's say this down here is another dendrite of another muscle or another neuron. So this dendrite would be accepting these neurotransmitters and these instructions in their dendrite from this axon terminal. So these electrical signals travel down the axon to the synapse. So once these vesicles of neurotransmitters get released into the synapse, they bind to the receptors on muscle cells and cause contractions if these axons are next to a muscle rather than another neuron. And you can see here, there's a lot going on. It's a pretty complicated process with calcium and sodium and figuring out how all these things work together for firing of the neurons. We are not going to get into that for the purpose of this lab. It's 
pretty complicated, not super relevant for you to be able to understand to be able to do this lab. So the drugs we're going to use today will either mimic, block, or have no effect on the neurotransmitters in the synapse. So think about what they might do to the heart rate of the Daphnia for each one of these things, mimicking, blocking, or having no effect. And in short, that's what a neuron does. As I mentioned, it's a lot more complicated with that, with figuring out the cell chemistry and neurotransmitters and all that. But for the purpose of this lab, if you've got the general gist, then you should be fine. So moving on to Daphnia. Sometimes these are called water fleas because the swimming style kind of resembles how fleas move around. It's a very jagged, sort of jaunty swimming style. They're planktonic crustaceans. Crustaceans um, include things like lobsters, crabs, that kind of thing. So these little guys are in that general group. And these teeny tiny little animals that live in permanent bodies of water, like lakes. Now, I'll admit, when I first heard we were using Daphnia for this lab, I wasn't excessively excited about that. But I started reading about them to see what Daphnia actually do and what their role in the environment is. And I found out they're actually pretty cool. There is this type of fungus called a kitchen fungus that is causing huge problems for amphibian populations. One of my friends during my master's program was actually studying the effects of kitchen fungus. And they can just decimate huge populations, salamanders, frogs, all of these amphibians. It's been a huge problem over in Asia. And um, there seems to be some indication that there might be some problems in America if this gets transferred over as well. But these little Daphnia actually go around and eat all of this kitchen fungus. So the Daphnia eats the fungus that could attack amphibians. So they do play a pretty important role in the environment of being able to keep a balance to things and helping out those amphibian populations by eating the fungus. So we have four drugs we can test today. We have nicotine, ethanol, caffeine, and CBD oil. One of these should cause the heart rate, heart rate to increase, one should cause it to decrease, and two should have no effect. So it's kind of up to you to decide what you think is going to happen for each one of them. So first, you should choose the chemicals you want to investigate and design your experiment. So this means making your hypothesis that is a causal explanation. Remember, it should not be an if-then statement. It should be for example, CBD oil causes the heart rate of Daphnia to increase or decrease because of this. So it's a prediction of what is going to happen. This will cause this, not if we do this, then this. Um, this is the equipment that we use for the in-person lab to transfer the Daphnia over. Do be aware if you ever work with Daphnia in the future, they are surprisingly fragile and they are easily killed. So I always reminded my students that were in person to just be careful and try not to kill the Daphnia if possible. After they were done, we um, let them hang out in rinse water for a bit to kind of get those chemicals off and let them chill out a bit. And then we return them to the tank at the very end of class. Um, first, we used our little Daphnia jar to scoop out these various Daphnia from the water and get at least two of them we could work with. So then, after that, uh, we used some cotton fibers from a cotton ball here to trap the Daphnia in place in this little depression. And this little speck here is the Daphnia. I did a little review for microscopes. so. Microscopes have these four different settings that you can use that have various levels of magnification. We were just on this very lowest power in the red um, lens. The coarse adjustment knob, this big one here, 
is what we use to focus. And then we also use the iris diaphragm lever to adjust the proper amount of light. So taking a look at the anatomy of a daphnia, A here is the leg-like gills, and these often get mistaken for the heart. I'll have a video here in a second for you to be able to see why that is. B is simply the eye spot of the daphnia. They don't really have complex eyes, so they can't see like you would imagine, but they can detect light and that sort of thing. So their eye spot is what functions in that sense. C are the antennae. Then D here is the heart, which is what you need to be watching for the uh, lab today. So right here, circled in red, is the heart. And then E is just a fetal daphnia. Um, these little guys reproduce like crazy, so it's not uncommon at all to have a baby or two there. It doesn't affect the experiment at all, and it's fine. So here's the video I mentioned. Right here at the red arrow is the heart that we need to be measuring. So you need to count how many times this beats per minute. And just playing that again here real quick, these are the gills that you should be ignoring. You can kind of see how it looks a little bit like a heart rate, but make sure you are looking at the heart here instead. So to follow the procedure in the lab background is how we did it. So basically we recorded the lab daphnia heart rate before we added the chemical. Then we followed the protocol to expose the chemical to the daphnia. And then we recorded the same daphnia after adding the chemical. Take a moment and think about why we should do it this way. Feel free to pause the video if you need a chance to think. The reason we do it this way is because the pre-chemical daphnia actually serve as the control. So daphnia have wildly different heart rates from one another. They can be pretty different. So being able to judge your baseline to the after treatment is really important. So for example, let's say your Daphnia 1 had a baseline heart rate of 200, and then after the treatment, it went up to 230. Okay, 30% 30 percent, 30 point change beat per minute. Let's say though you had a Daphnia starting at 310, and that went up to 320. They would have more heart rates, but it'd be less of a change because your Daphnia's heart rate started higher to begin with. So being able to get a baseline is basically the control for this lab, and then we'll compare the pre to the post treatments. So this was just kind of some specifications on how to actually use these Daphnia and then rinse them off and then transfer them back to the tank. Since you're not doing this lab in person, this isn't super relevant for you. And then finally, um, I just reminded students to return the last Daphnia to the tank rather than leaving it on a microscope because that tends to happen a lot. And then of course we clean up after ourselves and put everything away. Um, if you have any questions about any of this, feel free to reach out to me, email me. I want to be here and help you out as much as I can. I'm going to go ahead and go over to Canvas real quick to show you the data that you need to be using. So for here, the um, here is our Canvas web page for the lab section. And if you go to modules, like usual, you should be able to scroll down here to the Daphne section and open this up. So we have a special lab background um, that we should be using. They It gives a little bit more of the background since you weren't here in person. Um, so definitely make sure you read it that if you haven't already. Um, you will then use these heart rate videos to count the pre and post exposures. And then here we have an experimental data set. So 
you take a look at this, it, whenever you open it up, it'll look kind of like this. So basically, we already have the pre and post exposures of three other trials. So let's see, say you want to use caffeine data versus nicotine data versus ethanol data, you ch choose that over here at the bottom. So let's say ethanol data. If we recorded three different Daphnia, these would be our pre, and then after we give them ethanol, this would be our post rate. Once you watch this video online of the different heart rates, that I showed you just before, then you would include your own data in this as well. So here's the video for caffeine, here's the one for ethanol, and here's the one for nicotine. So you're going to do all three of them and add your data here at the bottom. Basically, this just gives you some additional data points. That way, if you happen to get the count a little bit off is okay because you have all four. So usually the best way to do a graph like this is if you do a bar graph, which it's pretty easy to do. So you just select your data, then do insert recommended charts, and then it gives you here various different options. So for example, this would give you the pre and post exposure for trial one, pre and post for trial two, pre and post for trial three, and then your data would come here once you actually put numbers in. This obviously needs to be labeled. You'll have to put in your chart title. You need to edit the series so that it reflects pre and post, and then also label your axes here. And you can put all of this into a single chart at the end. So let's say, for example, instead of having the, you know, I actually just changed my mind when I was saying that. Go ahead and do three different charts for your online uh, lab submission. So this one here is what your caffeine data would look like. You'll have an extra bar here with your data and then talk about what this means. Does this overall seem to have no effect? Are they increasing, decreasing, interpret this data for yourself. So make one chart for caffeine, one chart for nicotine, and one chart for ethanol. And each one should have the four different trials on it, like this example graph does here. Again, you find that those here on the Canvas webpage on where to actually record that data. So you can see how this information is, you have the pre-exposure heart rate, it's 10 seconds. So you can count here how many times this beats over 10 seconds and then multiply that by six to get your total heart rate. And then you'll have the post-exposure heart rate where you then also count the number of beats per minute this Daphnia has. So if you have any questions about any of that, feel free to reach out, let me know. I'm here to help as much as I can. Also, remember to complete your fifth grade video and turn that in on time as well and upload this to the COVID submission thing instead of your normal lab submission since you are absent for this day. Uh, if there's any way I can help, then please let me know.